to the physical world and how that works, right? So let's do this. Let's bring Mr. James Kane into this and let's get this summit going for you all. I'm sure you've done listening. There he is. Hi, how you doing? James Kane in the flesh. I love the haircut, Paul. Hey, thank you. you. You're noticing, <laughs> huh? You're noticing. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, they're all closed. They're all closed in the UK at the moment, so I, you can't get you can't get your hair cut. There you go. Oh, I did this one at home. Actually, my wife <laughs> it was a bowl <laughs> in the tub at home. Uh, well, when I say me, I did a little bit. The wife did. My wife Callie did most of it. So uh, we also well, you, you, have, you had your bowl there yesterday. Do you still have the bowl? Oh, I got the bowl. Oh, is it? The yeah, yeah. This is the one he one. used. This is the exact was one. The, was your hair that bad when it's <laughs> when you got home? It goes poof like that one. <laughs> I got the bowl. I got the bowl. Uh, I would also okay. like a special thanks to Monster City for actually sponsoring yes. this this segment yeah. that we're doing with James and the team there too. So they're they're uh, yeah, they're one of our awesome. sponsors of the summit, and they're sponsoring this actual presentation that we're going to get into here. All right. So this is going to be exciting. Let's. Uh, so James, how are you doing over there? Yes. How are things? Good. For good. You? I'm all set to go. Today? So not bad. Uh, yeah, all good. Um, all set to go. Yeah, all right, I'm going to show you guys some really interesting stuff. Hopefully, um, it's going to be perhaps something. Well, fingers crossed, it's something that a lot of people haven't really seen before in ZBrush, um, because basically, uh, it's a very, very free workflow. Uh, I mean, basically, what I'm going to show you today. Um, it's not restricted by particularly, I mean, workflow is always, I always think with the word workflow is not applicable to this because really there's not a lot of restrictions. I'm not, you know, I, I, workflows exist for, uh, for a purpose, of course, because if you're working in a team, you've got, it's got to be, you know, re, you've got to be able to re replicate it. But really with this process that I'm going to show you, it's very much, um, you, you know, more artist focused, you know, you are more um, crafting something and, I guess really what I'm trying to do is is kind of recreate that feeling um, in with with digital software with with ZBrush. Um, so uh, this is this presentation is going to be for intermediate uh, ZBrush users. So I'm going to scoot around ZBrush quite quickly. Um, so and I've got a custom interface. So I will try and kind of sl slow down in areas where I think, oh, maybe you'll need to know where that menu is or whatever. But so, but please forgive me because I, I need to, of course, I've only got a small amount of time, so I need to kind of m move on. Um, so, yeah, this workflow is very much very, pretty different. But I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, I'm going to give you a bit of theory as well as a bit of technique as well. I'm going to try and squash it all in. Um, so I'm going to, um, going to tell you basically my whole thought process of how I go about actually making a monument um, from the ground up, really. Um, and, and that's the creative process as well as kind of getting into the nitty gritty uh, with ZBrush. I'm also going to tell you about things you need to think about in terms of printability. Uh, and this is actually even more important with this particular case because we, it's going to go to a CNC uh, workshop. So um, you'll need to deal with that workshop. You'll need to be able to hand the files off. Um, and also expect them to come back. Uh, so you're going to have to understand, you know, like what to, how to correct things, um, and you know what 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 you did wrong. Because you'll find a lot of the time it's like you're like playing whack a mole uh, with when when you're when you're kind of trying to troubleshoot with with print based stuff. Probably very similar to other um, uh, digital processes actually. Um, but hopefully I'll be able to cover that, and hopefully I'll be able to cover that with James. There'll be a bit of crossover with, with James Powell there from Monster City Studio as well. So, yeah, um, and you did this piece specifically for the summit too. And I did because you guys are so nice. I thought, oh, I'll just do it for you. No, I, I mean <laughs> it's it's Remembrance Day as you said here in, in the UK. I always send tend to miss Remembrance Day. I always want to do something for it, but I'm normally working or whatever. But it just uh, the you know the stars aligned on this one. And I was like, yeah, I've got, I've got the time. Let's, let's do it. And uh, I think I wanted to do a bust and there was a kind of things going around in my head, but um, I think we settled on this kind of full statue that you, uh, that hopefully you, you'll, you'll, you'll be seeing me uh, break down for you. Yeah, you weren't, um, you, weren't, you started with the bust and said, all right, I'm just going to do a full on yeah, uh, one figure, but three. No, <laughs> yeah, just just I'll do the whole lot. Yeah, actually, yeah. I, it, so the the angel was a bit later, but it was you know it's part of the process. It's part of like looking at what you're doing and then think, oh, you know, I need perhaps I need to add that. 
in and uh, and change things about and you'll see that i flipped the statue at one point and all kinds of stuff so yeah i mean i'll hopefully be able to cover all of that with you guys yeah go ahead we'll we'll let you take it from here now and we'll just be fantastic for it all right well the first thing i mean so here's the here's the final sculpture now i thought i'd sort of um come ahead to the final sculpture because um it will give you an idea about you know what what the final outcome was and um, how it actually merged with what I, you know, my, my, the, my, how I was thinking at the very start of the of coming in to design these sort of this sort of statue. So this is a couple of things you kind of got to think about when you're um, designing something like this because there's no sketches. I mean, they, I guess you could sketch it, but I actually prefer to go straight into it. Um, but there are a few things I've learned as I've been doing these sort of statues where uh, bits of theory. Bit, bits of like visual notes um, that, that I'll always go back to and little things that I look for when I'm starting. So, um, I mean, the first really uh, that I'll do is I'll actually try and think about an actual design in terms of like uh, basically the golden ratio. So as you can see here, um, uh, I really thought, you know, how does this fit? How is this going to leave the eye? How is this going to fit inside a nice, golden ratio you know how is it gonna look um and of course the statue is very different to an image you know we're not we're not working in 2d here we're, it's got to work the whole way around as well but of course most people are going to be looking from the front as well so that's what i tend to focus on and then everything kind of sort of fits into place around that so i look primarily for like the golden ratio that's one of the first things i'd get out and get in my head of course, the statue when I started looked very different, but it's still something that I look for. And actually, when I go back to, you know, the final piece, I'm like, I can actually see it, you know, as you can see here in the overlay, um, it's actually there. So um, it's just a very, I always have these um, images on my um, spotlight as I can overlay them and um, I can sort of test the, the actual composition out. Um, the other big thing for me, and this is all about storytelling, actually, when you're store when you're actually working, doing a statue like this. For me, the most important thing is actually storytelling. So uh, one of the ways to help that is how to lead the eye, um, because, you know, you can actually tell a story by leading the eye across a piece. And so in this instance, my heart, my thought process, I mean, coming into doing the statue, I wanted to simplify it as much as possible because, I mean, monumental work, especially, it's it's useful to be to simplify things. So especially it goes from everything to the form to, uh, to the actual um, design of everything as well. Um, now, so I wanted to start leading the eye from the ground upwards. And so you can see in this overlay um, with, the, with the red arrow, the, 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 I've kind of thought about leading the eye across and then up. So it actually follows from the soldier's feet to the uh, through the head up into the the top soldier's head, and then follows the angel's arm. Um, now, for me, this piece was always going to be about actually vertical lines. Vertical lines are a very very important little little device you can add into your pieces that help break natural shapes. Um, so at the very very start, I'm always looking uh, for these sort of shapes and. Uh, so if you look at the piece, you can see I've actually added things that actually enhance that. So uh, I've got um, the, the wooden boards behind here. Uh, his arm as well is a straight line. Uh, of course, the horizon is a straight line. Uh, you know, everything, everything here. And this all reinforces that design ethic uh, going, you know, going into designing the statue. Uh, sometimes you'll do these without these things without noticing, and if you first start doing this stuff, you'll be like, "Well, it's kind of tricky to to pick it out." But as, after a while, you'll be like, "You'll actually start thinking about this stuff before you actually start um, uh, sculpting, and it will really help you uh, tell a story, to you know, comp compose things, um, get things, you know, uh, have a bit of control over what pe how people are going to look at." at this particular object. Um, so the other thing that I've learned to do as well is, uh, is think about tension points. And this was really important um, with this piece especially because um, the idea of this piece is the is the uh, the soldier in the trench with the, um, if I show you, uh, with the dog tags. Now these are English, British dog tags, so they're a little bit different to the American ones, um, but they were on a, on a bit of string. 
Um, but I wanted the, the soldier in the trench to be looking at the dog tags. And then the idea is, of course, this, this guy above is the fallen comrade um, and then being kind of pulled away. So there's actually tension there in the narrative. So it was really important to me to try and get that across in the actual design uh, of the piece. Um, so as you can see, and I've done that with triangles in this piece, and you'll see that a lot in, in a lot of, uh, in fact, to the work, if you go somewhere like the National Gallery, you'll see, uh, you'll be able to break down all those paintings into think, into shapes, triangles. And so I always try and look at look for that sort of stuff in, in my work. Um, and so you can see here, the two main points of tension are near the soldier at the bottom's head in the trench. And also the point of tension is where um, the, the, the top, top soldier's head as well. So those two are kind of designed to kind of be kind of points of tension in the kind of silhouette of the, uh, of the piece. Um, so that's something else that I tend to, to look for um, when I'm designing. Um, so the other thing and the, the final thing when it comes to design is that I remember um, some a good friend of mine des describing um, sculpture as painting with light and this effectively or painting the shadow perhaps um, and that's effectively what you're doing with these this sort of sculpture it's a physical sculpture so um, I'm trying to think even though of course this is going to be as you'll see Monsters Studios will show you it's going to be a small statue at first the idea is this is going to be a monument in a public space or you know in someone's garden or um, so it's going to have direct light from top to bottom uh, and if you know this and you know what the lighting set up with the five for the final piece is going to be then you can actually use that to your advantage to actually um, design uh, the piece narratively as well. So on top of all the other visual stuff I've done, I've also thought about that. Um, one of the key things I do is to take things into key shot and then to, to test the lighting. So we've got, an, as you can see on this piece, I've got a nice top down light. Now the idea of the lighting on this, and hopefully if this is in a, in a not like a normal sort of space, um, you're gonna have a top down light. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna help basically uh, create a very mu a heavy shadow on the guy on the, the top guy the guy in the, uh, that's above the trench now i kind of wanted to create this because i wanted that kind of ethereal look uh, uh, to the piece because this guy's dead is being uh, pulled away but he wants to come back uh, and i wanted that kind of mystique to the face area so actually you can do that using light and shadow with sculpture as well it's quite it's quite a fun little uh, uh, technique um, you can do um, so I'm actually thinking about all of the, those things when I'm when I'm doing this, uh, when I'm when I'm designing. First off, um, now if I show you the um, the first, so this is kind of how I roughly block things in. So let me just um, sorry, I'll take that off. Um, so I mean, basically, this is how I will start to block things in. So there's several ways of blocking things in, in actually, especially with this sort of technique. Um, anything goes like you don't have to use a base mesh you don't have to do, you know you can actually use a zbrush mannequin if you want to and ultimately everything's going to be meshed together dyna meshed and, and then um, decimated so uh, you know no uvs nothing you don't need anything you can literally just sculpt uh, and and kind of forget about all of that um so that's normally how i would start but what i'm going to do is i'm going to go back very very quickly and show you um really my thought process when I'm designing these things to in terms of like how printable is this you know how is this going to is this going to give um the the printer uh, kittens I mean at the end of the day I, I, I said to, to Joseph last week if if I haven't given the printer kittens and I haven't done my job but um I guess there there is that kind of um thing where um you know, you do have to keep that in the back of your mind because if you pass this off to people and then, you know, they come back and there's a problem, you're the one that's going to have to fix that um, and you want to minimise that as much as possible. I mean, at the end of the day, the people that are printing this are the experts and you have to defer to them. But the more you can minimise that back, back and forth, uh, the, uh, the, more, the easier your life is going to be. Um, so looking at this, uh, one of the things that was struck me is that there are a lot of gaps going on um, so my priority with sculpt while sculpting this is making sure that uh, there's no gap here. But if you are closing here between the guy's arm and the backboard there, 
um, and there's minimal gap between the legs here. Um, these legs here are together. They're fused. They will be at the, in the final piece. They'll be fused together. That that way, James and Monster and Monster City Studios won't have to keep separating everything out, merging it all back together. Um, uh, and it's also easier for them to print and CNC. Um, otherwise, they're going to have to cut it all out, and uh, it's going to give them a lots of headaches. And the only thing I couldn't get away with was, was the arm. Now I wanted the arm to uh, to be over that, so that will probably at some point have to come off. Um, it could be CNC, and this is where you've got to defer to the to the actual experts on it. But I think um, uh, you need to definitely defer to them uh, on that. Um, but I, yeah, looking at that, I was like, well, that's a sacrifice I'll probably have to make uh, going forward. Um, you'll see as well, there's no gap between the cloak because it's all between the, the body and the cloak. It's all one piece. Um, you know, I've joined the uh, the hand. The hand is flush with the body as well. Um, this is to make everything easier when it's print, you know, to make it printable. So are you um, being con uh, cautious of, um, conscious of this when you were actually doing it or did you have to go back oh, yeah. and do stuff? No, no. I think uh, to save time, I used to actually like, you do like a crazy piece and <laughs> you have to go back. But of course now I like, I know what to look for. So yeah, I know I will actually go back and like even this, even where you can see the, her arm there, well, that's separate, but actually at the end of the day, it would be really, I know that it would be super easy for James to be able to come back and maybe fill that bit in. It's just thinking about all that stuff. Like, as far, like you won't catch everything because, like I say, they're the experts, you're not. My focus is sculpting, theirs is actually printing. I like that. I don't, I, although I like to understand a bit of the process, I think at the end of the day, you want to defer to the people that are actually doing it, as will hopefully see later. Um, but even things like that where I've actually left the gap, I'm thinking, well, what's that going to look like if it's filled in? The answer in this case is no one's going to notice. So you have to really think about that when, when you're actually starting, uh, if, you know, while you're sculpting even, because you might make a decision and then you'll have to commit to it. And then all of a sudden you've actually created something that's kind of not principle or it's going to cause a headache for the final piece so the more you can think about that at the start uh, the the better that the, the easier your life will be basically um but we'll go into more detail later with james on that i think as well so i, I, I need to move on and show you roughly how i will block you block this all in so like i say there is no people ask me well can i have your base mesh or what base mesh do you use or, or whatever just use the one you're comfortable with um i actually have you this one uh, i can't remember who the who the artist is but i actually have had this for a long time and it's a base mesh but i've like subdivided it and then cut it up um now the reason i do this is because i find the base mesh and intact base mesh super distracting like i always want to fix it when i'm posing it uh, and the reality is, as you've just seen in the final sculpture, um, it's not it's not needed. You don't, I don't really need anatomy is kind of a, a, an afterthought for most of the body on this piece. It's going to be covered. Um, so I don't really want to focus specifically on that. I just need to make sure it's right. Um, and then I need to move on. And again, I think the, the total work time for this piece was about five days, although it was over a space of three, four weeks period of time I had about five days to work on this so I'm constantly thinking um you know what's how efficient I can be preferably I will start with something even more basic than this but in this case I think it, it suited it so actually this is my first block in the, the figure and, and the figure at the bottom. so you, you can see how I basically will block things in now this is kind of a sketch really so that I know roughly how it's going to look so and, each one of those cut yeah. lines, those are separate pieces of topology, right? Yeah. So basically, I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm going to like for, for five minutes, I'm going to try and <laughs> pose this guy up for you, so I can show you exactly how that those separate bits work. But yeah, I mean, if like, looking here, you can see it's like super loose, um, but it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be like really tight. It doesn't matter um, because at the end of the day, this will all be covered. Um, you'll also, I'll also, show, I've got a sort of another sub tool, uh, another. Z tool, sorry, where I've actually fixed the anatomy to a point that I'm happy with to go forward. So I'll show you that as well. Um, but basically, if I go to, I'm going to take my line off. So 
basically what I've done with this is this is like, so you can do, you can even do this from a scan. You can buy plenty of APOs kind of scans or whatever, or like someone's base mesh, um, just, just cut it up. Um, and then you can go to auto groups, which I've got here on my um, uh, interface, but I think it's under the groups menu under, under sub tool, um, poly groups, sorry, I think I had it there. Um, there yeah, is auto right. groups there. Yeah, right. I still remember Paul. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I so basically once you've cut these up, you can click on auto groups and now I can select these bits individually and I can hide them for posing. So let's, let's get cracking with posing. So standing pose, um, what I'm gonna do is actually, this won't be very good guys, but I'm gonna do my best. Um, just to give you an idea, I'm actually gonna delete that. Um, so it's out of the way. You can see actually another piece that I was I was trying. So like there's no, although of course there is a rush, um, there isn't, this, this is actually one of the most important pieces of uh, the most important stages of the sculpt for me, because if I don't get this right, um, then it affects the rest of the sculpt. So I'm gonna move this guy into place. And yeah, the standing pose is, it's, it's very, um, it can be the mo one of the most trickiest things to, you know, to, to get right. Um, so actually the main thing is to get the weight right. Um, so basically I will hide this and then I'm going to actually reverse out. Oops. Oops. Oh, start up. So I'm just going to hide these and then I'm going to mask that. So that way I can actually, using the gizmo, I can actually um, move this here. Um, and then I can, hopefully, I don't know why I can't reverse that. That's really weird. <laughs> I'm going to do it the long way around then. Um, oops. I'm just going to hide these. And I'm actually going to hide that as well. And that way I can actually choose or get a weight, a bit of weight on the hip so I can kind of rotate this guy around. So he's rotated. I can move him forward and I can do anything really. And I'm not really messing up the base mesh particularly. I can always undo this if I'm not happy. Um, but he's got that kind of weight on his hips now. Um, then I can, um, I'm going to do all this long way around because for some reason my mouse isn't working. Um, I'm doing all this with my mouse at the moment, by the way. Um, now I can sort of move, rotate this guy around here. So instantly he's kind of got that feel, weight. And that's, that's basically what I'm looking for. A little bit of weight, a little bit of, yeah, a little bit of um, contraposto, basically. So that kind of thing where you've got the, um, where you've got a bit of, Con, uh, contrast between the hips and 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 the uh, shoulders um, where I've got this kind of line here and a line there um, so yeah I mean basically I realize I'm running out of time so uh, basically that that gives you an idea that's how I start that's how I pose stuff now you can also do that by masking a base mesh you can do it any, any way any way you want but I like that this way because it's kind of nice and loose um, so there you go um, nice and posed um, so it kind of <laughs> because I had the um, I had the boots already done um, at this stage. It kind of looks like a bit like a, a runway model or something. It looks kind of weird, but um, just to get, I just wanted to get the boots in there, um, just to just to get an idea of where the, where how his feet would look and how they're how they're kind of placed on 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 the statue. Um, when you start these, James, do you just do, do you do any sketching, or do you just go straight and look for images? Straight in. And you just start straight in. But I mean, actually, if you look here, um, I've actually got an example. I wanted to show an example. Whoops. Of um, sorry. You made it smaller. You made it smaller. Did I make it super small? Oh, oh, anyway, um, the um, yeah, just oh, that's the amount of uh, that's the sort of stuff I will get, like photos of all the uniforms and stuff. I've already got a load of that because I've been doing quite a few of these. The, these um, sculpts so uh, but I've got a long library of that so I actually you know I'll be looking at that before I actually even start designing but at, normally I'll go straight into ZBrush and get cracking um, 
because you know, it's just so it's a lot easier for me to me to do that it's just i can move stuff around uh there's no i can be super destructive at this stage and it doesn't matter um because i can always undo it uh so there's a there's a level of patience involved uh, sure. uh with it um uh, but that's what I kind of like about this process. It's not easy. It's not like um, it's kind of a challenge as well. Um, but yeah, so here's the, the final piece. So now I'm already kind of seeing um, what I think the composition is going to be, um, how it's going to work, um, and then it's just basically a case of get get sculpting on top of that. So um, as you can see here with this guy, I've actually from let me just see if I can got a solo one but so here it's very very loose and here now i'm actually moving and firming up these points doing the same as i was doing uh, up there so um i wonder what's happening in there oh, that's bizarre uh, yeah, you anyway. have spotlight on probably still and you gotta go turn out the projection and brush ah. samples or turn off or hit shift z to turn off spotlight yeah, it's off now there you go. um yeah, my, my mouse, let me just see if I can get my pen to work. No, there's some weird stuff going on. Um, anyway, I can move on. Um, I can't actually deselect that, which is weird. Um, um, anyway, so that's that would be how I... Um, how I uh, how I would go go through and select these bits, mask them out, and then uh, and then move them about. So as you can see, I can move them about, um, and then also I can also sculpt on them. So um, I can sculpt using my brushes and just getting all this stuff right so that it's uh, it looks right. You know, it, I can get the anatomy looking. So I'm going to put clothes on top of this. So. At the end of the day, I don't want to spend, especially if I've got time, you know, I've got a lot of a time constraint. I don't really want to be sculpting anatomy that's going to be hidden. So, I, but it, of course, it's got to inform the clothes underneath. So, and when you're doing um, this, are you in Dynamesh or Sculptures Pro mode, or are you just using subdivisions? A question. I'm just I, um, literally, I'm just working on the mesh as is. So, I think I've got active points of 861. Now, that will be the same active points as you can see active points are 855 so it's about the same so i'm literally i'm not actually done anything with this mesh since i've actually posed it so i'm just using the move brush on top of all of what i've already got now you're not in dynamesh mode right now not in dynamesh mode no because i don't want to mesh this stuff together yet because i want to be able to select it and move it about um mm -hmm. uh, okay yeah it's super weird for some reason my my mouse is just gone oh, it's the first time it's ever happened to me <laughs> Because you're presenting That's yes. yeah basically anyway you get the, you get the idea um so the next thing i wanted to show you guys well firstly the faces on this were totally asymmetrical so um i will literally start with this face here so i'm not i'm not taking this off um i will literally just start to sculpt on here blocking in my forms um getting my brush settings right just digging in um, getting those eyes right, get making sure I've got all my proportions right, um, and then a massive smooth on there, and then starting again, just keep digging into it, make sure I've got all of my landmarks roughly right. And this is a really, really long process. Uh, it's much longer than... Um, I've got uh, sculpting symmetrically, but what you'll get is quite a nice uh, set of features because they're no one's face is symmetrical, right? Um, that this is the thing, and and because I'm not beholden to a specific workflow, like I don't need to flip my UVs, I don't need to symmetrize my UVs or anything. Like I can work, I'm totally free to work like this. Um, so this is what I'll how I'll do it. I'll actually go in, smooth everything out, start again. Like I'm looking. Um, I can actually isolate this guy as well if I want to. So, uh, and you can see I've got a bit of stuff there. So normally what I'll do is I'll split that head off. So I'll select that and I've got a split hidden up here. So that's now split off. Now what I can do then is go to geometry, 
Dynamesh and then Dynamesh that. Now, I, the, what's cool about Dynamesh is you can add a polish to it as well. So depending on how big I've got this, uh, it will add these nice planes. And it's just an, basically what I'm doing, Paul, is I'm trying to, dis, trying to discover the forms and planes by doing this. And it's it, like I said, it's a long process, um, but it's a lot of fun. And um, you will get a quite a unique kind of face. So, um, so as you can see, I've started. Um, yeah. Question, the way you're working, you don't use the grouped option for Dynamesh then with seeing as separate pieces? You can do that. You can do that. But yeah. I like to have it as separate pieces because what that lets me do is if I'm getting distracted. Oh, actually, do you know what? Sometimes you'll panic and you'll be like, oh, you know, it's not working. Um, it's obviously the main feature of doing stuff asymmetric. Right. We're not used to it as digital artists. We love to, right. even to start stuff symmetrized. So in that case, sometimes it happens to me, and especially if I've got a deadline, and I actually did it with the angel's face. I panicked a little bit, and I was like, I need to get this right. Sometimes you, you don't have time to fix it. So in which case, I will just split it off and then start it up as another subtool. Uh, and then I'll actually, what you can actually do is split that or even get, uh, make a new poly mesh, and then you've got it as uh, on its own. And you break tool. symmetry this early for you in your workflow. You like to break it's symmetry. All asymmetrical. It's all asymmetrical. Yeah. You're breaking it early. Okay. Yeah. So, but if I need to resymmetrize this, all I've got to do is just get use a gizmo here, and um, get that into rough, and then I can just do a mirror and weld on that, and now I can access it. I can actually, sorry, sculpt it um, symmetrically. So that's just mirror and weld up here. Um, and that in this case, I've, I, then I've rescued it. Then I'll, then I'll sort of bring it back in, um, and I'll delete this one, um, and I'll, I'll pop the. I'll literally just go to append on the subtool and uh, append that um, head in, and then it's done. Um, but I prefer to work symmetrically, so you can see here uh, asymmetrically. So uh, you can see here where I'm actually starting to um, build up the forms a bit better. Uh, so that's at the very, very start where I'm really looking at um, putting this together. Um, and as you can see here, this is how far I got. Um, so if I click on this, you can see it's totally separate. It's actually a separate subtool. Um, so I can move this about if I need to. Um, and uh, yeah, um, it's, it's, it's super easy to manipulate. But this one... If I show you, you can see it's super wonky on the bottom. That's because I was adding weight to the face as well, which you can't do symmetrically. So I'm actually thinking about how his face folds into his um, his shoulder there as well. Um, and I could do that. I, of course, I could have done the face symmetric, but I'm always going to add that weight in it anyway. So the reality is you're actually sculpting something that's asymmetrical symmetrically. So it's kind of there's kind of a, 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 a bad logic to that, isn't there, really? Um, that's my kind of theory behind it. So really, let me just put this, this guy's stuff back on. Um, so here you can see, now I've got everything posed up. I actually jumped ahead for this uh, tutorial, uh, this, this talk, but um, this is how I start most of my clothes. Um, so I'll literally just append in a, um, a sphere and then I'll literally just scale that down. And then I'll literally, I mean, you can use a masking to do that. Or I mean, I'll literally just move it using the move brush. I'll just move it into place. And then, then it's move, 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 move <laughs> until you get like the right and then a bit of clay build up um, where I want it. Um, and then, yeah, I'm going to delete that because I'll be there forever doing it. But then, you know, you basically get this kind of rough um, blocking. Um, and then I'm looking at how the, especially with cloth, I'm looking at how it all forms up, how it how it is going to interact with all the different various um, props that I've got. Um, I, at this stage, I really want to start blocking any prop, any props that are going to interact with a cloak because, of course, that's how you figure it out. Funny enough, it's the same way you work with Marvelous Designer, really. It's the same, it's a similar principle. So I want, if I'm doing this, I would need to block in. I mean, actually, at this point, the only thing that's actually in the way of the cloak would be his hand. You can just about see it there, but that I actually buried his hand there on purpose. So, um, so yeah, that's how I would go about sort of sculpting that so then i'm looking at well you know sculpting the pipes of the cloth so i'll go in there with clay build up 
and then I'll smooth that out. Um, and a nice little secret I've got for you guys, and it's not a secret, it's super old school. You're going to love this, uh, Paul. But um, I'm going to use a bit of the standard brush um, and then modify it to create a cloth brush. So um, bear with me. So I'm going to use, uh, go to our brush settings here. And under depth, I'm actually going to create a little bit of gravity, probably about 30. Now you can play with this. It's good fun to play with. And you'll get different effects uh, depending on what you want. But so I'm going to add a little bit of downward pull as well. And here's a little, there's a little, slight little secret. Maybe no one knows, but um, add a little bit of brush modifier to that. Uh, I'm going to just say seven. What that's going to do is pinch it ever so slightly. Um, and now if I, I'm just going to subdivide this a little bit to get a, a little bit of extra. Now, now I can start, as you can see, it's a great brush to kind of figure out these little folds. Um, now what you can do after that is Dynamesh. It's like this, this is just a really like patient process of building up your shapes and so that's probably a bit too high, actually. Yeah, that's about right. Um, now, I'm, I, I like I tend to work fairly high resolution, actually, as well. So, I mean, the big thing with cloth is it is the way it forms at the bottom. So, I'll move, I'll match the pipes up here with a bit of movement down the bottom. So, I'll just pull this in, um, and then sculpt on this. And this is actually where slash re comes in. So I've got slash reselected up here. This is where this comes in handy because it's a really nice deep brush and it's kind of screen dependent. So it's not dependent on the normal. So I, if I sculpt in this direction, it's actually going to sculpt on the on the surface uh, um, to my camera direction, to my visible direction. And it's kind of nice because what you can do is kind of create these slight overlaps um, and, and dig right in. Um, yeah, James, I just want to give you a heads up. We're going to be bringing Monster City in soon, and just in case you have another tip you want to show. Um, and yeah, so that. let me just move through. Um, so anyway, let's let's get back to this. So um, he can see, so basically using this technique, literally um, I'm just sculpting through the cloth using this um, using this new cloth brush that I've got. I can kind of create this 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 cloth effect um, and. It's what I've done across the whole board. Now you can see also I'm starting to the actual bits of anatomy that are visible. I'm actually going to um, sort, you know, actually get uh, firm them up, get them correct. Um, I've actually added some hands on there as well, and they're there for help to help me visualize, and I'll sculpt on them later. So all um, your main wrinkles were with that standard brush you just showed everybody with. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, um, and then but building up as well. So you build up your forms with clay build up, move smooth. Just the standard stuff. Um, the other little thing I want to show you guys is the clay brush that I use. So if sometimes in this process you'll push things out too far or, or whatever. Um, so using uh, the clay brush with a bit of back face mask, which I think is under auto masking yep. under the brushing. Yeah, there you go. Yep. Still remember. Um, now, it, the standard um, uh, clay brush is a bit too intense, but so I've taken it down to about 10. Now, say for example, like these, I'm not happy with these folds, they need to be dialed back a bit. Well, you can smooth, but I like to use a, a very light clay brush. And what that does, that will smooth this top stuff out here. And if I just smooth it out after that, it actually, it doesn't destroy the, the sculpting, it just tones it down a little bit. So it's actually a great way um, and that will work for everything. For example, on this guy's hair, um, I can actually tone down this hair a little bit. So say I don't like how deep that hair is, I can actually run the clay brush over a little bit of smooth and it will give me a little bit a little bit of more of a toned down effect. So I use that quite a lot on various things to, to, to basically um, tone everything down. Um, so again, these these putties, which were what the soldiers wore to keep the mud off their uh, out of the top of their boots, these are just separate cylinders I've added, and then I've just duplicated them down, sculpted on them, moved them about until they were right. Um, and you can see I've added the angel again, same thing, same principle. So if I'm going to solo this, you can see I've just blocked everything in, but there's no point in me blocking 
you know, doing firming up too much anatomy because as you can see, it's pretty much hidden. So all I need to know is where a hip is here because that's where it, what interacts with the cloth um, and, you know, where our shoulders are. And yeah, so, and again, with the, I'm building up these sort of forms and, and undulations of the cloth um, just by, I mean, I did this one without reference, so that there's a lot of errors in it that I normally would correct with reference. But I think I like this because it kind of, I came up with some nice kind of simplified forms in the end. Um, and also I'm playing around with a bit of, I think I was trying a little bit of um, uh, experimentation with the size, scale and size as well. Um, but here's, here's our final piece. Um, so as you can see, I've actually added the um, all the different bits of paraphernalia. So that, again, that I'll, I'll go back to my reference to look at that. Because they weren't interacting with any cloth at the time, I've left those till kind of, they're kind of the last things I added, I think, really. Um, and then I'm just, all the, it's just then just sculpting on top, sculpting, 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 and, and until I get it right. And the wings on the... Um, on the angel are dynameshed and then i'm using uh damon standard to, to sort of uh block these out and pull, pull out the feathers and then slash three to kind of i can solo that um to kind of give them a bit of depth uh, and then actually you can pull out with slash three as well it's a little bit extreme but you'll get this nice kind of pulling so out you're using, you're using slash system. three right you're using slash correct three. yeah that's correct uh, slash two is great as well but uh, slash two um, let's see if I can get it up. Well, yeah, I've got my own... Go get. I think it's in the light box. If I remember. It's in the light box. That's right. This is my own. Yeah, yeah, this is my own version of it. I've got a light. La la the key to slash two is the lazy mouse button, which is down here. And then I, I usually just a very light lazy radius, and that will smooth out everything. Um, but slash two is great because what it does, is it does, is it gives you it gives this nice depth. It's nice line, but it's got a bit of depth to either side of it. So if you've got a flat surface like that, you can actually pull out feathers. I mean, you could pull out feathers here, and then you can then mask that out and pull it out if you wanted to. Um, then you can sculpt on it. So all um, your feathers were done with pretty much slash two and slash three. Bit of clay build up to build up some. Uh, yeah, I mean clay build up is great because you get the nice sketchy feeling. And you can build up some nice forms and you can, if you're, you know, it's kind of destructive. So you can smooth, you know, I like to be destructive at the start because I think um, I don't like to be too precious. I like to really pull and push things about and get them on the screen. That's why I don't use sketches either, really, because I like to get it on the screen, get it in front of me, push and pull it about. And normally this is a, a longer process. I've done this pretty fast, um, but it's kind of what I, it's, Kind of where I get my. Yeah, you're using ZBrush as your sketch, so you're like doing a 3D sketch in essence. Is what you're exactly, doing. exactly. Um, Did and you then, play with I mean, the camera at all? And the thought of this is going to be a monument. Did you do anything with the camera at all, or turn the camera on? No, off? I didn't actually, and I did think of that. I ran out of time, um, but yeah, I mean, you could do that as well. Um, uh, it's yeah, that's quite. I mean, one of the other things actually is if you're making a physical piece, you have to. Put, you have to make sure it's balanced. It will balance when it's actually printed yeah. and cast. So that's the other thing I forgot to mention. Uh, it's kind of like one of those things that you don't think of. And of course, if you're a traditional artist, it's kind of there in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, but here, like, so I had to lean in forward ever so slightly because I was kind of worried. There's a lot of kind of, yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot, there's yeah. quite a long way for it to fall. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so little things like that, that, that actually, I've heard of some people that will take like a decimated version to Maya and then run physics for it to see if it will topple, which I think is quite a good idea. Um, so yeah, but it's something you need to think about. And then of course, as you say, Paul, get maybe getting it into a, like a real world, um, uh, like render, that would be awesome too. I didn't really get to that point, I'm afraid. Uh, but hey, we've got the real thing, right? So yeah, <laughs> it's gorgeous. Um, yeah, yeah thank, you. Nice. thank you, thank you. Nice. Um, so I think I'm there. I'm, I, I can do some stuff about printability on my own if you want, but we can bring James in now. If yeah, well, that's let's, okay. let's bring the crew in from Monster City because then we can add that them to the conversation of going from you now to a yeah. crew that's got to physically make the product itself. Yeah. Right. Lucky them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. Yeah. It's your turn now. <laughs> We're going to bring in Monster yeah. City now, which we have James Powell and his team there that took the next process from James Kane. So James Kane did this piece as a monumental piece for Remembrance Day, which again today is UK's Remembrance Day. 
Um, it's Veterans uh, Week, in essence, here in, the, in North America, for Canada and the U.S. I'm, as in all countries, we have amazing people involved in our military. So, James, I have my poppy. I yeah, poppy. There's the poppy. There's probably only Canadians and UK people who know the poppies, though, right? Is there any? Probably us. Yeah, trust. I mean, is that a thing in yeah. the US? No, yeah, yeah, they do them in the oh. schools and stuff. So, oh, do they? My ch yeah, my children were all drawing uh, poppies this last week. Yep. I thought it was just a UK oh. and uh, yep. Canadian thing. All right, so let's bring uh, let's bring Monster City in here. They're ready to go. We're going to introduce you guys here to James Kane, and he's got his CNC machine actually going in the background, and we're going to be able to have a discussion now of the next process into something like this. When you're sculpting something that's going to be physically made, what would you do now and how things that maybe Monster City had to do? And they're also going to show a little a uh, little piece there. So Kyle. Yeah, and yeah, just be careful too, like just a warning, like there's going to be a machine that may be loud in this, uh, the audio, so. Yeah, if it's too loud, then we'll turn it off. And when I say we, them. <laughs> <laughs> not me, not me at all. So we're, again, we're gonna, there's gonna be a machine running in the background when we bring them in and then um, we'll be having a conversation with them. What is that process? All right, for all that. So, um, but the team. There he is. There we go. There hey, hi, James. There we are. How are you? Oh, look at that. There it is right there, Mr. James Kane on the right. Go full screen, James Powell, for us. Let's go full webcam, James Powell, so we can see what he's got there. There you go. Wow. James, tell us what the process was for you. Go ahead. Check, check that out. So welcome to Monster City Studios. Uh, I'll tell you what, it has been such an honor to work with James Kane on this. He is, if there's a next level sculptor out there, he is it. And this, oh, thank you. It's, it, this is so near and dear to us. Uh, back in, in the 50s in the Korean War, my father, he was actually on the front page of uh, just about every newspaper in the U.S. Uh, he was feeding a puppy. So it's this really well-known Korean War photo. And I see something like this, and it, I just, I love World War One, World War Two history, and this, this is amazing. So to be able to have the opportunity to do this, James and uh, Paul, thank you very much. Uh, so welcome to Monster City. Uh, here we build things for amusement parks, large-scale replicas, fine art. We do a lot of large-scale reproductions. This is Big Red. This is a seven-axis KUKA robot. KUKA? KUKA? Uh, it's called Kuka. 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 Really, the upper torso and head of James' sculpture out of a four-pound foam. From this, we could actually go and make a fiberglass sculpt. We could make a plaster sculpt, uh, even a master for a true bronze. You could see right here. This we printed on one of our Form Threes. And for any of you that don't use Form Labs equipment, I'll tell you what, this stuff's amazing. It's so, so finely detailed. And this is actually printed in the draft resin. Oh, it so, is? Wow. So you guys, wow. didn't, you guys didn't paint that? That's not painted? You're, that's right off the printer? So this, is, this is just painted. We And I'm going okay. to talk a minute about our metal coatings we can do here. But that literally, other than painted, is, is straight off the printer. There's no hand detailing or anything like that done. Um, and it was printed at 100 micron in draft resin. So it was taking oh. parts that would normally take something like 20 hours to print and bring in, bringing them to like five hours. So it was just cranking out uh, so fast. We only got the model, what, last week sometime? So, uh, man, we, we really, it's, it's just, just such a beautiful sculpt. But the reason, the, the reason we have this here, though, is hey, be careful. be careful with that. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's wrong. It's heavy. No, uh, <laughs> The reason we have this here is we've kind of, in a way, somewhat by using the 3D printers, we've kind of reverted to instead of using our phones or our iPads or a laptop for our sculptors to bring up their reference, because these printers with draft resin, they're printing so fast now, we're printing the sculptures in a practical model that the sculptor can actually have with them so they can still use their digital Mm -hmm. But they have a practical model where when they're sculpting, you know, this robot, it does a lot of detail, but it doesn't get certain undercuts and things like mm -hmm. that. 
So to be able to analyze those, they can use this as a reference and really get that detail. Sure, you can get it digitally or you can open ZBrush and look at the model. But I mean, you can't get much easier than actually taking something out of ZBrush, printing it and having it in your hands to sculpt. It. So James, so, for that machine, so people yeah. are aware of, how did you start? It's just a big block, right? That you're starting with? So people yeah, so that was literally just a big block of this four pound foam. That foam is a special foam that you can put fiberglass directly on, right? Uh, it's not like white foam that the fiberglass would attack. Uh, so you can put urethane paints, fiberglass resins right on it, and you can make masters, you can make final articles. But all we do is we take the model out of ZBrush. Now, when James Kane sent us that model, it was a gig and a half. It was big. <laughs> it was heavy. I was it just was testing. I was <laughs> testing this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it had about 90 million points, right? That's right. About 90, actually 102 million. And I actually got it oh, down to 97. <laughs> Almost everything we use here is 10 million or less. And yeah. it's very common for us to use models that are a million points. Because mm. we'll take your model and we'll decimate it way down. Mm. Uh, it, we, well, we, we need yeah. the form, but for some things, we don't need all that detail, okay? Uh, the robot is super accurate, but at the same time, our hand sculptors will get in there and do, do the really, really fine detail. Yeah. We don't yeah. need force, right? <laughs> we, we don't need certain lines. You can get rid of those, and we put those in by hand. Now, as awesome as the seven axis robot is it's still not a 3d printer you're not going to get that really really fine detail unless we want to have a block of foam or, or a block of wood on here for a week or two weeks which in that case we can do it but you know who's got that kind of time right so we take a block we load it on here we send the the, the model generally an stl file so we can get the size correct we'll send it over to jorge in our cnc department He's in charge of the robot, and he will then toolpath it. And the toolpathing, because it has seven axes, this toolpath, the toolpath that the robot has to take is extremely complex. It's not like your standard CNC machine. But after a while, he gets that toolpath. We load the block on, and then this thing just takes over and, and really does everything. It changes all its own tools. So it can go from a giant tool that big around and that long to a one sixteenth of an inch tool without any human interaction wow. whatsoever. Man, can I get That's that crazy. one on thing? Can I get that one on thing? <laughs> Wrong tool, Paul. Switch the brush. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So uh, you, from this, this is yeah. this is just making our master, right? So a lot of yeah. times we'll take something like this and we'll make molds from this. Oh, okay. Like black yeah. molds. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we'll make we'll reproduce right. the piece over and over again. For the theme parks, that's what we do. We'll make one, and if they want 20 of the same thing, we'll just make a mold, and we'll throw fiberglass in it and make it over and over and over again. Right. Uh, and the same similar process for the film industry also. So uh, we and really enjoy having this. And then, like, printing, you're making these in pieces and then putting them together. Right, if you need to get a bigger, obviously a bigger one, you're you're doing multiple pieces and putting them together, like you would. Yeah, with yeah, of, of course, yeah, of course. Uh, now, I believe for with three D printers, if you had that new uh, Formlabs three L, I think you could print that as one whole piece. You could, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, you could. Could. yeah, on its side. Yeah. So yeah. that thing's pretty amazing. Um, yeah. Do you have one? Uh, we don't have a three L, but we have three. We okay. have two. Yeah. Uh, we have a few other printers. That okay. we won't talk about. They don't work nearly as well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> is that the only arm you have, or do you have multiple arms? That, that, that's the only seven axis arm we have. Okay. But we have two four axis flatbed CNCs that okay. are eight, eight foot by 12 foot long. So they can do uh, like relief. Anything. Yeah, like reliefs on a door or something. Yeah, yeah. You can even do a sculpture like this, but the you problem is. You're going to do it in slices. Yeah. You have to slice everything. Yeah. And then you have to glue it together. And the reason yeah. we got this is for, for sculpting out IP. Because mm -hmm. if this does, let's say, for instance, you're going to do Mickey Mouse, right? Okay. That has to be within a certain percentage. It has to be dead on or it doesn't get accepted. It gets rejected. 
right? So with this, we're not gluing pieces together after we mill them and then maybe they become out of spec. We glue a big block together first and then we mill that. So we know it's within the standard of the IP holder. Also, this is great for doing things like out of wood because you can glue up a big block, a big tooling block, hmm. and you can mill on this, and it's correct when it comes off. What wood? What Any wood? Is there any wood? Uh, we have wood? milled all the way up to ironwood with that. Ironwood? So, ironwood. So Doug Fur, we first started out playing with it, yeah. and then we were going into mahogany, which is pretty soft but great to carve. Uh, we've done black walnut and uh, up to ironwood. So depending on the bits, now when you get to those really, really hardwoods, it's mm -hmm. gonna dull those tools down really quick and you have to swap them out. How many bits do you guys go through, do you think? Uh, you know, because we usually do foam. Oh, okay. Yeah, not yeah. Go that, through that many. Now, if yeah. we're doing a big wood sculpt, right. we, uh, let's say uh, like a four foot by four foot by four foot wood sculpt, let's say, uh -huh. uh, we might go through two bits. Um, they do dull down. Luckily you can resharpen them. So, so that's, right. so. For instance, with this piece, we have this new coating system here that we got, uh, which is called Luminor. Uh, and you can see here, I don't know if you can tell on the skull, mm -hmm. it's kind of like a, uh, you can see it's copper. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. actual yeah. copper. This is actually coated in real copper. Oh, really? So, yeah. Right. So if you have- Brushed on or sprayed on? Brushed or sprayed? Uh, sprayed on. So sprayed. it's like a cold cast, right? Huh. We can do 11 different metals. So it's like a cold cast where you maybe mix yeah. metals with resin. Uh -huh. And you pour it into a mold, but instead yep. we spray it on. Yep. The cool thing about this is, you can see here, I don't know if you can see that patina, but Oops. that's real patina. That's not painted on. Oh, there you go. I see it now. Yeah. yeah. I see it. So you can you can do any kind of patina, brown patinas, green patinas, just using chemicals to that naturally react with the metals. So, for instance, here's like a, we're doing some bar tops, right? Copper. That's real copper. That's EPA certified antimicrobial copper, right? So uh, we're doing a, a job in Las Vegas right now, and we're doing a whole section in bronze of a bar, and the the bar is actually a bronze top bar, and okay. that's real bronze right there with real patina. Uh, so that that was sprayed on. You're saying or that's is that sprayed on, and it's wow. sprayed on pretty thick, and then you go through a polishing process. And it, it reveals the metal. The metal is mm -hmm. ultra fine. It is so fine. But it is completely fireproof, completely waterproof. As a matter of fact, the dome on top of the Bellagio in Las Vegas is coated yeah. in this stuff. Oh, and it's wow. been up there for 20 years. Wow. And it's still perfect. Huh. So it's, it's really cool, new, nice new add-on that we have yeah. on our big sculpts. Sure. So you can make, I guess you could say faux bronze, even though it has real bronze. It doesn't have to be a. Uh, and you guys are then just using brushes and stuff to. Yeah, yeah. Away. You know, touch up, but you get yeah. real metal, so you could put this piece outside, and it'll get a natural patina, and it'll last for years and years and years. I got so many things going through my head right now that I want to. Oh. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's pretty, us too. Us too. Just I'm looking coat, at this like coat okay. Paul and. I'd say we all sculpt something for Joseph's backyard. <laughs> I, I think it's garden. Just bronze it. He needs take this it. in the garden. Yeah, I'll yeah. take it. He, that that, that would actually go in a display case. I don't know if I can let the elements hit it. It's, it's got to you know, go. That we, one go inside. We were thinking, That's next to the nightstand table. It's the first thing I wake up to and the first thing I go to sleep <laughs> next to. Yeah. Right here. Put a little bed right here. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, it feels too intimate, Trust. I'm not sure I like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> we were thinking that maybe maybe next year at the summit, you know, we, we have a table there every year. Maybe yeah. we could do the full one and bring that down and put it in the courtyard. Yeah. That'd be really yeah, cool. That'd be awesome. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd be amazing. Someone's so, asking what spray exactly are you using? Do you, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a product called Luminor. Uh, there, I believe, are 11 or 14 different metals. Anywhere from a simple iron all the way up to what they call gold, but it's a modified brass, but they're all real metals. So <laughs> it can, <laughs> it's pretty amazing stuff. We're doing a, a bunch of signage now with it uh, and these sculptures. We've been lucky enough this year to, to work with uh, uh, some really, really well-known artists and we're mm -hmm. starting to incorporate this. We worked a number of times with Tristan Eaton, uh, El Seed from Paris, 
Uh, we've worked with Mr. Brainwash down in Hollywood, uh, Peter Tunney out of Miami, uh, Fidia Falaschelli, who is out of L.A. and in uh, Italy. So we've been a able to work with a lot of these fine and, and top uh, culture artists. And this stuff is, this and wood is getting to be a big thing. Well, it's awesome. It looks like, you know, it totally looks like a brand. And it's going to be cheaper, I would say, in the long oh run. Oh, my God. I'm feeling a whole bronze. It's, it's not cheap, mm. but it's way cheaper than doing a bronze. Much cheaper, yeah. I'll yeah. give you an example. Uh, we have a, a brand new huge casino that's going on up here. And we were, they had wanted some real bronzes done. And uh, I want to say they wanted something like a dozen of them. And they were going to be around 25000 a piece. And they were, weren't that big. Um, they might have been a little bit more than that. Uh, we figured that if we did it the exact same way, but with this coating, it'd bring it down to like 10000 a piece. So the, the savings is, is huge for any commercial uh, environment. Definitely, definitely something good to have. So my next question is, James Kane, do you have room for that in your office there, buddy, with printing back there? Which one? We, oh, the one, the one at the, the back. One. Oh yeah, loads. I got loads. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you could see, you could see the top of that helmet, like from the from the main road, because I live on a main road. You'd be able to see the statue from the main road, like <laughs> over the top of the trees of my garden, probably if that was in the backyard. <laughs> that one's going to Dress Garden. <laughs> is it all right? Okay, I'll yeah. take any. I'll take any. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'll take it, but I always need permission to put anything else in my house. So. No doubt. No doubt. Uh, but I, I think that being able to take a sculpt and bring it into the practical or the, or the actual real world, mm. uh, it's one thing to, to have it set up for 3D printing, but it really is quite a bit different for having it milled or robotically milled. Uh, we, don't, we don't need the detail. We don't need that heavyweight file. You know, we, we don't care about textures or coloring or anything like that unless we're going to do that by hand here. Um, mm. We just really care about basically a, uh, a, a dynamashed hollow file. And, but in, and make in, it easier for us. in terms of actually sculpting as well, you're looking at a much more um, simplified way of sculpting as well. I mean, uh, we have we've done two things, haven't we? We've done the, the sort of more detailed form three piece, which all the details, as you say, are going to show. But if you're sculpting primarily for CNC, then you need to be able to think in more simplistic forms uh, for those to be reproduced. Otherwise, you're going to be wasting your time doing a lot of sculpting. So yeah, yeah, you have to. It's definitely a different kind of mindset uh, to have. Certainly, certainly. You mm. know, uh, when you when you mill in a traditional CNC, there's a lot of things mm. a traditional CNC, a four, three or four axis, or even a five axis can't get. Mm. Right. You, yeah. Can get a lot more. But How long is that going to take, James? That one that you're doing uh, right now? This year we started yesterday, but it was off for a while, so we okay. could be ready for the the summit. But uh, by tonight, that part will be done. Uh, you'll you'll be looking at probably a 24 hour run on that. Uh, so this whole the whole sculpture, which is gigantic and it's huge, uh, mm -hmm. we'd say probably about four days or so, and we could have the full thing. Wow. And what's your final size? You're you're gonna have this at the height wise? Uh, it is life size. So okay. if we, if we want to, you know, say that this this guy here is let's say about six feet, you know, mm -hmm. we're gonna be probably close to eleven or twelve feet tall. So it's a big sculpture. It's a monument. It really is. Right. Uh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah. We're we're really excited about that. I can't can't wait to see it. It's, yeah. Uh, me neither. Me neither. Yeah. <laughs> It's certainly, there are other things we do also here when we're doing the full-size sculpts. Like, for instance, we'll put armatures inside of sculptures. Uh, obviously, if you're doing it out of foam, something like this gun, these legs, you're going to need steel in there. Yeah. Mm, uh, yeah. If you're yeah. doing it out of fiberglass, same thing. You still need a steel mm. armature inside that model to give it strength. Mm, fiberglass, yeah. very strong, but when you start getting down to these small parts, it's certainly, certainly something that you have to reinforce. It's so it's so it's what I was saying during my piece. You know, you got to think about. You kind of got to take yourself away from the screen and think about this thing as an actual object. Will it tip over? What are the? It might it might balance if it's in resin, but if it's in a, some a heavier material, you know, where are the weak points going to be? Yes. All of that sort of stuff that you yes. really need. Yeah, and this is where I think actually there's a level of communication between artists like myself and you know creators such as yourself, James. There needs to be a backwards and forwards. 
and and uh, you know, like a dialogue there. It's really important to have that to uh, With, early, a very early stage. Without a doubt, uh, James. Yeah. The the you know we get a lot of get a lot of artwork in for different companies for IP, and maybe that piece was a collectible uh, toy or something like mm. that. And the, and the artists will leave in keys, which you see all the time in the collectibles world or in the toy world. We don't use keys. You know, they, they don't yeah. do us a whole lot of good. Yeah. Uh, so those are things that we eliminate. And that's why we'll take a, generally we'll take a whole sculpt, not always, but we'll take a whole sculpt and we'll dynamesh it, make one piece. And then we slice it up to how we need mm. it sliced. Uh, yeah. Because it really is a different world than the toy designers or uh, yeah. the, uh, the yeah. artists that are just digital. Yeah. I mean, for the collectible stuff I've done, uh, I've just finished a piece that was 400 million po uh, points. So, and, and that will be printed, that will be engineered, printed out, and it will be in like 100 parts. Right. And you're there at the trade show putting it all together. And it's, so it's definitely a, diff a way different um, uh, mentality to sort of a more simplified uh, sort of workflow that we've kind of used in this, this respect, definitely. Yeah. Correct. In, in some ways, they're a lot easier to work with. And because of their size, they become a lot harder to work with and move around, <laughs> no doubt. Well, boys, unfortunately, we got to uh, all this segment done. We're going to uh, be moving on, unfortunately. I would, could talk to you two all day, honestly. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I'll remember that. <laughs> I, I want to thank the both of you for jumping in and being involved in this segment. You're most welcome. Monster City yes, thank Studios, you, thank you. the sponsor of this event as well. So thank you. The team at Monster Cities and James Powell for jumping in with us and pranking this out and doing all the work here. Thanks, Paul. Right. And James Kane, another beautiful sculpt, my man. Another one. Yeah, really. Thank you very really much, great. guys. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Miss you guys in person this year. I really do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's one thing about this. Virtual. I, I, really, virtual. <laughs> I really do miss seeing everybody. <laughs> yeah. And we miss Louis as well. We miss Louis. Oh, don't oh, worry. I know you play so. to Louis yeah. today, and he's already in yeah. the chat right now. Louis, we miss you, man. Mm -hmm. You're awesome. <laughs> uh, so, guys, I can't thank you enough uh, for doing this and having that printer um, going on in the back there. It's been really awesome. Awesome. Well, yeah. thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks thank to you. you and Jaime and everybody, everybody there. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's been a lot Andrew. of fun. It's been a lot of fun to do this. <laughs> I'm looking forward to all the other segments too. We got this is what we're saying, people. We're trying to do stuff like this where we got James Powell yeah, literally mm -hmm. at the studio. We got James Kane sitting at his house and his atmosphere, how he sculpts. And you guys in my, in my workshop. <laughs> yeah, his workshop. Mm -hmm. We're trying to give you guys the idea of how artists also work with even other artists too. So we're not done. We're just starting, right? You the timer. Let's we still got four hours and twenty two minutes of streaming. Wow. That's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. So uh, the Jameses, as I used to was calling you guys, James Squared. Any <laughs> last things for you guys before we say goodbye to you? And we're going to. I would. To I'd actually. Do you know what? I will. Be, I'm going to say a thank you. Actually, I've got a thank you to my friend Martin because I, I always tease him, but he was actually. <laughs> so, but you do. You need someone to look over your shoulder every now and then. And Martin's my man. So Martin, thank you very much, and you still owe me as well, anyway. But yeah, he's in here. <laughs> yeah, Mark, Martin's in the chat too. I saw him yeah, in there. He's there. Yeah. Hey. Uh, really quick, I just want to say, guys, remember Magic Wheelchair. Got to remember Magic Wheelchair. They need help. There's been no cons for fundraising. For oh, that's true. Yeah. true. So, uh, you know, and, and all of you at Pixelogic have been so supportive and helped us out so much. And so many artists. Shane Olson, who I know is going to be around. Um, great artist. And so many others. Eamon and Daniel. Uh, all you guys. Really miss seeing you guys and uh, yeah. remember Magic Wheelchair because it's it's in our hearts. It's Absolutely. really important to us. Yeah, for those that don't know, Magic Wheelchair is a organization that makes costumes for kids in wheelchairs. And uh, Monster City's been a forerunner for this. They're for free making all the costumes, getting artists involved. And it's all time for free to make these kids some wheelchairs. And we did one a couple of years ago, uh, next week. So mm -hmm. that's what Magic Wheelchair is. That I know awesome. someone put it in the yeah. chat too, so people are aware of it. Yeah, we I put it in there. Thank you, Dross. All right, guys. All right. Thank Thanks, James. Dice got it too. Thanks both, James. Thank you. See you guys soon, okay? Enjoy the rest of the summit, everyone. You Cheers. too. You enjoy the rest. Don't don't just stop watching now. Yeah, that'll be it. I'm off. Watch the rest. It's like 10 o'clock <laughs> here nearly, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, All right, guys. guys. The Jameses have a wonderful uh, day. James Kane, have a wonderful evening. All right, guys. We'll see you. Thank you. 
Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.